QC Pod is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. This is QC Pod. I'm Jason Tuga. QC Pod features the people, projects, movements, and ideas that make up the Queen's College community. To learn more, visit us at queenspodcastlab.org slash qcpod. Tiara Miller studies psychology and pre-dentistry at Queens College with a minor in cities and social medicine. She's dedicated to social, economic, and racial equity in medicine, and she plans to found a dental practice that models these principles. Natalie Bumpvina is assistant professor of urban studies at Queens College. She received both a JD and PhD from Northwestern University's School of Law and Department of Anthropology in 2016. Her research and teaching interests concern environmental policymaking in U.S. cities. Vina's long-term research examines the history of natural resources preservation in the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, which protects 69,000 acres of land encompassing Chicago. She's currently undertaking fieldwork and advocacy concerning a Southeast Queens community's protracted recovery from a sewage backup that occurred in 2019. This past summer, she wrote an op-ed for the Daily News, advocating for a fully funded CUNY. In the article, she quotes Tiara Miller and tells a little bit of her CUNY story. The two of them join us on QC Pod to share their CUNY stories, discuss the impacts CUNY education can have on people's lives, and examine the current economic threats undermining CUNY's mission. Natalie Bumpvina and Tiara Miller, welcome to QC Pod. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Back in June, Natalie, you wrote an op ed for the New York Daily News that was really great, in which you tell your mother's CUNY story and a little bit about Tiara's CUNY story. And since then, I've been really hoping we could have you as guests on QC Pod. The title of that article is How CUNY Helps Dismantle Racism, Keep Funded a Vital Lifeline for New Yorkers of Color. The article is great. It's full of facts and full of great arguments and also impassioned and personal in in the way that you tell your own story, your mother's story, and Tiara's story. So I'm hoping that you can both start us off today by just telling us a version of your CUNY stories. Basically, my mom is a graduate of Bronx Community College. So my mom entered Bronx Community College in 1971, just a year after CUNY started the open admissions program, which guaranteed every graduate of a New York City public high school a seat at CUNY. And um, my mom just happened to learn about this program from her college counselor. Uh, She went to uh, Louis Brandeis High School on the Upper West Side. And he said, hey, there's this program. Um, Where do you want to go, basically? And she was taken aback because she really had no solid plans for going to college. Um, She was this marginal student. She wasn't a great student. She had a lot of challenges at home. Her father um, became seriously ill with kidney disease when she was 10 years old. And he passed away when she was a sophomore in high school. And so basically beginning when she was, you know, very much a kid, like 10 or 11, she uh, was responsible not only for herself, but for her siblings who were um, quite a few years younger than her. And she was also dealing with her father's chronic illness, very serious chronic illness, and just trying to grow up, you know, um, as a kid. And basically she... Yeah, so she really had, she didn't have the support, you know, to systematically think about college. So this opportunity was basically golden for her. And again, the open admissions program had started just a year before in 1970 is when it was rolled out. And so in 1971, she decided to go to Bronx Community College because they had a nursing program. And um, she didn't graduate until 1976 because some semesters she didn't have enough money for books. At that point, CUNY was free, 
but you know you still had to pay fees and you still had to pay if you were a nursing student for these very expensive nursing textbooks and she also had to support herself so there were some semesters that she just couldn't afford to be a full-time student you know she had to work um and so she eventually graduated in 1976 um, she almost didn't get her degree because she was really struggling to pass this pharmacology exam that was necessary for her graduation. But she ended up, um, you know, basically getting help from a faculty member who spent four days tutoring her um, so that she could pass, which is incredible. Um, and she, you know, basically became a nurse after that. And she and my dad ended up meeting at um, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, where my dad was a resident and she was a nurse. And so really without CUNY, there's, I just wouldn't, I mean, without CUNY, there's a great possibility that I would not even exist, um, let alone have all the opportunities that I've had because, you know, my mom ended up having a wonderful career, um, you know, experienced tremendous social mobility in her life from, you know, her parents' generation to her. And um, I've just had enormous opportunities because of what CUNY gave her. And do I have this right that she has both a BA in psychology and an MS in nursing? Yes. So she ended up right. So she got her RN um, through. Bronx Community College's like two year, which is supposed to be a two year nursing program. And then, yeah, when she moved to Chicago, um, where I was born, um, she ended up going on to get a BA in psychology. And then, yes, and then she became a nurse practitioner. And so, and she has basically worked with um, low income communities of color for my entire life, first as a pediatric nurse on the south side of Chicago, and now as a psychiatric nurse. In your op-ed, you quote Tiara using the term domino effect to describe the impact that CUNY can have across generations. And Tiara, your story is not exactly the same, but it strikes me there are some parallels between your story and Natalie's mom's. I didn't grow up with that, that a lot of hardship in that respect. Like, I still have both of my parents um, I grew up in, for most of my life, grew up in a mainly middle class suburb of like Westchester County. But one thing I will say is I am the first person in my family to attend college <laughs> um, and pretty much finish because I should be graduating this upcoming spring, um, let alone the first person in my family to even want to pursue something like a doctorate in anything. So it's, it's one of those situations where it's not even so well, it is also about money, because <laughs> I couldn't afford Stony Brook. Even still, that's a state college. And I got into Stony Brook, and I couldn't afford Stony Brook. So it's one of those things where I looked at all of my CUNY options and four grand a semester, like, that's doable. And they have payment plans. So I went the CUNY route and I started off at Hostos Community College thinking I wanted to be a dental hygienist first. And nothing wrong with being a dental hygienist. It's an awesome career and it's actually really hard to do. <laughs> but I started speaking to my counselors at Hostos and the way that I guess we were discussing dentistry, he was just kind of like, how come you just don't pursue pursue further? How come you just don't go the full Monty and go for your doctorate? And I was just like, hmm, <laughs> that's actually a good question. Why don't I just do it? And then literally from that day forward, I just took all the prereqs I possibly could to be able to apply to any dental school I'd like to go to. Um, I will say, however, that that probably wouldn't have happened if I if CUNY didn't exist or if CUNY wasn't in my reach, because at the end of the day, my parents also did not they they didn't even graduate high school. You know, they had GEDs. They don't know how the college process works. We don't have 
um, dentist friends or or physician grandparents or we don't have any of that. So it's it's one of those situations where I wasn't exposed to the language. I wasn't exposed to the professions unless I actually went to the doctor myself. Even then, I wasn't seeing a doctor that looked like me. So it was it was something where CUNY opened my mind to the fact that you could do more. You could be more. There's nothing wrong with what you came here aspiring to be, but why not push it? Why not push yourself? It really shows how powerful the effect of one good counselor can be, right? Seriously. I mean, if that person hadn't been there to say that to you, who knows? Who knows? I I might yeah. have I might have actually been a hygienist by now. And I might have found my way into dentistry, into that higher level through that. But I decided that it's worth it's worth the risk and it's worth the trouble, quote unquote. Like, it's a lot of hard work, but it's worth it. I got to say, I'm really grateful to my dental hygienist. Me too. I love... I see them more than I see my own dentist. It's kind of crazy. Like, I'm just like, wow, you do majority of this. Turning back to Natalie's op-ed for a moment, the argument you were making, Natalie, was about the defunding of CUNY, which predates the pandemic by at least a decade of underfunding. And that has meant severe understaffing. And that's only gotten worse during the pandemic. But one result of all of this is that a counselor like that one that talked to you, Tiara, and encouraged you to go into dentistry might well not be available at CUNY or working at CUNY anymore. I mean, the understaffing is is really severe. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, could you, Natalie, just bring people up to speed on the argument of your article? Right. So in the op-ed, um, I point out that CUNY is this amazing vehicle for racial justice in New York City, in New York State, and, you know, the nation. For instance, my, you know, my mom ended up going to Bronx Community College, but she's spent most of her career in Chicago. Um, So the reason I wrote the op-ed when I did was that we had basically had this brutal spring with COVID. We're online and all we kept hearing about were the forthcoming layoffs, all of these adjuncts about to be laid off. Um, So that was a nightmare. And I felt isolated. um, And I wasn't really sure what action, you know, was even safe to take at that point. Um, At the same time, George Floyd had just been murdered. And there was a lot of conversation, obviously, um, about how Black lives matter. And guess what? Black lives have always mattered. Um, So, you know, it's, and a lot of the conversation, rightfully so, had, you know, been around policing and, um, you know, racist systems of policing. But um, at that point, there hadn't yet been really the pivot so much to, okay, where are we taking that money? and investing it if we are defunding the police. Um, So obviously scholars have talked about that for a long time, um, like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, but you know, it didn't, it hadn't really entered, I think yet so much the conversation and the outrage after George, George Floyd's murder, which is understandable because it was, I mean, his murder was so outrageous and terrible. Um, But so I kind of jumped off that and basically said, look, we need to be advancing racial justice everywhere, not only in criminal justice. We need to be talking about racial justice, for instance, in higher education, which we know is an engine of social mobility. And CUNY, um, I last fall, I don't know what the numbers are last this. I do not know what the numbers are this fall, but last fall um, CUNY had one hundred and ninety five thousand um undergraduates of color i believe 190,000 undergraduates of color that's a ton of people um 70 percent of cuny students are people of color and the fact that this 
institution is being starved at a time where as a nation we're supposedly reckoning with, you know, our histories of racism just does not make sense to me because this is where it's at. This is where it's at. If we fund CUNY, we can not only change the lives of, you know, current students, we can change the lives of their children and we can change the lives of their communities. And um, th that, so that to me just needed to be, and, and I will say PSC CUNY, of course, has articulated this. Other people have art articulated it. It was just at that moment, I felt like that message was critical, critical. Yeah, also publishing in the yeah. Daily News gets you an audience that the PSC doesn't necessarily have, right? So that seems important too. I guess so. So yeah, I mean, more, I yes, the Daily News um, has a, huge readership because it's a New York City newspaper that focuses on New York City um, issues. And a lot of elected officials read the daily news and their staffers read the daily news, which is my understanding. So it was definitely pitched to them. And actually, I end by um, suggesting that and basically advocating that the state legislature and ultimately Andrew Cuomo adopt the SHARE Act, which would increase taxes on the wealthiest New Yorkers in order to fund um, K-12 through SUNY and CUNY um, schools so that they wouldn't have to suffer from these budget, budget cuts. Now, um, the SHARE Act, along with so much budgetary movement, has been shelved. Um, I think the SHARE Act was put on the table last spring after COVID, but um, COVID has basically, my understanding is given our state leadership an excuse to offer Andrew Cuomo tremendous powers over our budget. So I guess right now, according to PSC CUNY, um, which is you know the union for faculty and many staff members, um, Andrew Cuomo mm. is withholding 20% of the state budget. Um, and has been given permission to do this. And so CUNY is one of the agencies, one of you know the state agencies that's just essentially reacting to that and with its own cuts, including tremendous um, layoffs of adjuncts. And um, we're not, and the thing that is so crappy about this year, and again, it's been really, I mean, I think it's been going on since last fall, quite, quite frankly, even before COVID, it's been going on. But this like idea that the, the shoe is about to drop, the other shoe is about to drop, the other shoe is about to drop. Like, I just feel like I'm constantly living with that. Like, you know, everything just always feels so precarious. And it's really hard as a professor sometimes to work in those yeah. conditions because we're supposed to be so, you know, like thoughtful and critical and, you know, we're supposed to be expending all of our mental energy on our research and our teaching. But this to me, you know, requires so much mental energy, um, you know, worrying about what is going to happen to CUNY, what's going to happen to Queens College, what's going to happen to my department, and most importantly, what's going to happen to my students. I mean, it that's really tough. And so I think that with the op-ed, I was also just trying to, to basically channel some of that angst. And I feel like this, you know, interview was also a way to channel some of the angst that is just there, like constantly. I don't, I'm interested, Tiara, do you feel like, do students feel this angst too, like this uncertainty about CUNY or is it less? Absolutely, because it's, it is, it's very true. Like it affects the morale of our professors in a way that whether they realize it or not, we notice it. Like, cause we're not, we're not in first grade. Like we know how to pick up, we know how to pick up like social cues and human behavior and motion. We, we can read people too. So it's just like, you can see in a lot of the professors, whether they're, they care too much and they're, they're just like so scared, but they still care so much. So they're just doing as much as they can 
before they can't teach this class again, mm. or they just kind of, to an extent, have given up and they're just like, it's all asynchronous. Here's the work. Here's the syllabus. Email me if you have questions. I've had that too, especially this past summer. It's crazy. But um, I just, like, with all due respect to Governor Cuomo, all due respect, I know that this is hard. You know, this is hard for everyone. But it seems a little backwards to me to sit here and have a conference about the protests that were going on after the murder of George Floyd and sit there to fix your mouth to say something like, I'm with the protesters. You wanna say that you're with the protesters, guess what? Majority of those protesters are CUNY. We are them, they are us. That's us in those streets. This is our people that's being affected not by just police brutality, it's all systemic. It's everywhere. Education, I think in Dr. Vanna's class, like every sector that we've talked about, anytime I raise my hand, I'm always just like, education? And like every single part on the syllabus, I just always somehow tried to tie it back to education. And it's true. You can't sit there and say that you care and that you understand where we're coming from and why we're marching and why we're upset and then want to keep taking taking funding from an institution that already needs funding to help those same people that you say that you understand it doesn't make sense and i just i know i say all due respect but seriously i say that kind of with disrespect like, I don't appreciate it. Like, it doesn't make sense. You're a governor. You're, you, you uphold one of the highest rankings in New York State and in the country. People know who he is. What you say matters. What you say in your actions, they have to align with each other. If they don't, you're just all talk. Well said. Thank you. I hope the governor listens to this. And if he does listen to it, I hope he will pay attention to your story. With that in mind, how did you get interested in dentistry? I've always loved dentistry, even when I was a little kid, like I was a weirdo. Me and my older sister, we'd have our dentist appointments on Saturday mornings every six months and super early, like 8 a.m. appointments on a Saturday. And normally you'd be dragging your feet like, oh my God, I don't wanna do this right now. But I'd be so ready. I'd be so excited. I would love it. I'd hop in the car and <laughs> and we'd go to my dentist's office and I'd always be asking questions from the moment that I walked in. Like I'd be in the chair, like talking to my dentist. Her name was Dr. Lavelle at that time. And I just, she'd be in my mouth, like with the, with the drill, like just cleaning in between the teeth. And I'd be like, what is that called? And she, and she would just always be like, Tiara, please. <laughs> Like, just wait. It's okay. You can ask me anything. Just wait. And, you know, at the time, I never really thought, like, I want to be a dentist. I just always had fascination <laughs> with dentistry, oral hygiene, taking care of your teeth. Why do we have to floss? Like, why is it important? Like, what does fluoride do? Like, I just always had this curiosity and, a tr like, and I was always so attracted to it. It just took me a while to understand why I was attracted to it. It's because that's what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to be that. And I'm meant to, I want to be a pediatric um, dentist. So, and I'm a psychology major. I strategically picked that because I understand that a lot of people have this innate fear of dentistry. They don't go to the dentist as often as they should. They fear. It's like they hear dentist and they cringe. Um, I want to try to find ways to attack that head on, especially at a young age. So by taking on a psych major, taking courses that talk about um, psychopathology and talking about childhood adolescence, like the way that their brain works, how it's possible to, you know, diagnose certain things with them or notice certain differences that can help me later on as a dentist that sees children. It can it can help me get through to them because might even help unlock their own potential to be something like something bigger. 
So if I can do that and do what I love, it would just, it would make my life. My sources tell me that you took Natalie's class because you're doing a minor in cities and social medicine, which is hosted by the Urban Studies Department. And I just mm -hmm. think it would be really valuable yeah. for people to hear about what that program's all about and how it relates to your goals in dentistry. Okay. Um, it's the Cities and Social Medicine minor. It is ran by the Urban Studies Department. And basically what it is, it's, it's, it's this beautiful marriage between sociology, psychology, history, and medicine and science. It combines all of those different subjects into one course in order for you as a future healthcare provider or a future healthcare administration worker in any type of aspect you'd like to put it in. Like it helps you tie in where some of these really backwards policies come from regarding healthcare, um, especially regarding black and brown people in this country. Um, why like black women are 300 times more likely to die during childbirth than any other race or ethnicity? It doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you, when you hear it for the first time. But then when you take a class like Dr. Vena's or Dr. Vena's, when you take a class like Dr. Vena's or when you take a class with Dr. Sardell, you start understanding it. It starts piecing together that this all is systematic. It all stems back to the ideas of scientists. They were scientists nonetheless, just very racist. <laughs> Let's call it what it is. Very racist scientists that were respected at that time. And their words were written down in a book. And that book just kept getting reproduced throughout medical schools, through the generations and through the years. And the books have changed to an extent, but the messages are still there. So we as future providers that are aware of this now, especially with this, with this whole minor, we have to change that. <laughs> it's up to us. Like we can't, we can't blame, we can't blame old psychologists from the 1900s anymore. It's done. They're gone. It's up to us. So it helps. That sounds spot on to me. I'd be really curious to hear you talk about how this would manifest itself in a, your dentistry practice. Like, how would it be different from other practices based on what you're learning well, and what you believe? In my dentist office, how I see it happening is I am always going to take state insurances such as Medicaid and Medicare. Um, mm -hmm. There have been a plethora of dental offices that I've gone to because I'm a Fidelis member. I I have state Medicaid. And you know what? There have been some dental offices and oral surgeons that I had to go to and they had to either deny me service or I had to pay out of pocket because they just simply didn't accept um, the DentaQuest that was underneath the New York State Medicaid. And granted, I'm, a, I'm an adult, but I was just, in my mind, I was like, what if I was a child and I needed this service done? You're going to turn me away like a child that I have, I have no control over my, my money and how much I have. And it's not my fault that I can't get this service, which is a necessary essential service. It's your health. It's, it's primary. You need it. So that's, that's my number one. No child. I can't turn them away. If they need me, I have to take them, especially if their parents went out their way to make sure that they had some form of health care coverage. Like, I could, uh, your mom went out the way to make sure that you had this Fidelis care. So it's, I, who am I to turn you away? I take an oath when I graduate to serve and protect and to do what you guys yourself aren't equipped to do. So I'm going to do it. So that's that's personally how I'm going to apply some of the lessons that I've learned and that I've felt myself over the years. Um, so access to care, 
making sure that people just have access, um, making sure representation is there, making sure that children of color can see another person of color in a position that's not normally seen, um, to have open dialogue and to connect with my patients also, and to hear them, to listen to their complaints. That's an issue that we have in our community also. Doctors do not listen to black and brown people when they're talking about pain management or they're talking about you know what's going like what's going on internally inside of your brain and i don't understand my fe- it's just it seems as if we're just it falls on deaf ears every time and not enough is done so even though it's a dentist's office it's my dentist's office my future one my job is to listen because what i'm listening to it could lead to a bigger problem yeah, hearing you talk about that, it just strikes me how CUNY plays an economic role in a lot of people's lives, but it also makes all kinds of social contributions to the city and the nation. I mean, the fact that this program exists is a way in which mm-hmm. somebody like you can start to transform how medicine is approached, right? And, and what's going on with the intersection of race and medicine. I hope that program will continue to be funded. Ooh, it better be. It's so needed. Or that, you know, right, the program itself formally funded, but what happens when the urban studies department doesn't have enough tenure track lines for that program to even function, which is on the table? It's really tough. It's really tough. We have... um we have a shortage of tenure track faculty and there are hiring freezes right now. We've had a lot of retirements and there is, a, I mean, it's funny you should bring this up because there is a concern, like what's going to happen to this program, this particular program, Cities and Social Medicine in the long term, if we don't get more tenure track faculty. Um, we also have an MA program and an MA in urban affairs program. And historically, um, this program has been a way for a lot of specifically women of color from Queens um, to get a master's degree. And that has led to them, you know, being able to have job advancement um, at their places of work, but obviously to explore their own intellectual interests. And again, if austerity continues to happen we're not going to be able to offer these opportunities. Yeah, like Tiara said, I think all faculty are feeling it. It's been five months since you published that op-ed, and the Shares Act is shelved, class sizes are ballooning, the governor is still Mm -hmm. threatening that 20% cut, which seems like it could become a reality. Um, Our budget is being held in abeyance more or less and uh you know everything's being cut across the board so i'm curious to hear how you would compare the situation now to what it was like when you wrote that article a lot of i mean the situation is the same i mean this you know in some ways i the situation is worse because it has been you know all of the outcomes that i talk about in the op-ed like Classes are going to balloon in size, for instance. Uh, Professors aren't going to be able to give students the individual attention that they need and deserve. That's become true for me. My classes are really big this semester. Um, It's an online environment. I know that some people, when they check into class, because I do synchronous classes, um... I know that they have, you know, other stuff going on or, or whatever. Um, and they'll stay in the room, but they'll like put the class on mute because I do cold call. So like regularly I'll cold call and people aren't there. And that's, I'm not trying to call out students. I'm just trying to say that the online environment is really rough. And so when you're trying to run a 35 person seminar on zoom, 
that's brutal. Um, and people are going to get lost in the shuffle. I have a lot of service commitments, um, even though I'm a junior faculty. So it's, yeah, so it be between huge class sizes and service commitments, and then I'm also pre-tenure, so I'm expected to do research. In terms of balancing all that, I, I don't think I would be able to yes. devote four full days to tutoring a student so she could pass the pharmacology exam like a professor did for my mom. I know I wouldn't be able to do that right now. And I also know that one-on-one -on -one attention, like for instance, what Tiara is describing with her counselor at Hostos, that is what makes the difference. That is totally what makes the difference in people's lives. And I can't do that to the same extent. And it's driving me completely nuts. And, and it's not just you, it's faculty in general. It's also the staff of every important office on campus because they're all understaffed. Financial aid, the registrar, the QC hub, all that stuff. Tiara, I'm curious to hear from your perspective as a student, what have these past eight or so months been like at CUNY mm -hmm. with online classes and everything else that's been going on? Yeesh. That's like the first. <laughs> it's just, it's been, wow. It, it, it's just been so crazy because especially when you're taking science, natural science classes, like organic chemistry, physics, when you're doing these things strictly online, including the labs, because the labs are also virtual, which is so back. It, I can't, I can't even get into it. Uh, <laughs> But when you're doing those things strictly online, no direction, no help, mm. only pretty much YouTube and email, which is pretty, you know, confined as is because it's email, um, you pretty much aren't learning much. I, I can't even, I couldn't even tell you guys right now what we learned in organic chemistry last week. I couldn't tell you because the information in and out, if if that, because it's so difficult. Even even my professor has stated how in the beginning of the semester how he is not he he doesn't really know how to do this. You know, he says all the time he'll show us the little models, the three D models, and he's just like, "I'm sorry, guys, like I'm better at doing this in person." And when they tell you that during the first week of a very hard class like organic chemistry. You get a little scared. I was scared <laughs> because the class was already registered, like already enrolled. It's done. I'm here. It's that's that. And I have to take it. So it puts you in a place where it's like, especially when you have a timeline and you have to graduate at a certain point in time, you have to make sure you know a certain topic to take your entry exam. And like it instills a lot of fear and anxiety into you. And I've been feeling nothing but anxiety for the past like four months, seriously. Like every day, anxiety. Cause you just don't know. You don't know what's coming on these exams. Some professors, they they even have like this, this angst themselves in a sense. They have this, like this anger towards us, the students, like COVID's our fault. It's not our fault that we're home and we, we're able to have access to the internet. And it's not our fault that this is happening. If I could sit in a lecture hall and listen to you talk about organic mm. chemistry, I would. I would, because I'd, I'd retain the information so much better that way. But we can't. <laughs> and yes, I'm going to use Google occasionally because it's hard. <laughs> and sometimes he's not able to explain it the way that people need him to. So. It's, I don't know, the exams are different from what we're taught. And it's it's just a lot for so many of us. You guys should see some of these WhatsApp group, ch group chats that us, the students, are in. Like for classes to help each other with homework questions and stuff. Like everybody is flying off the handle. Everyone just doesn't know what to do with themselves. Some people were talking about just dropping out of pre-medicine altogether. And I was just like, no, don't do that. <laughs> 
<laughs> These are weed out classes. That's the point of them to weed out the quote unquote weak people who can't really think cognitively and like who can't get around their own thoughts and like, that's why we have to take these classes. It's not because you necessarily need to know organic chemistry to be a dentist or to be a primary care doctor. You don't. They just need to know, can you cognitively be able to jump over this hurdle and figure it out? It's all a test. I wish CUNY leadership, I wish the governor, I wish all our legislators, uh, pretty much anyone that matters, and, you know, all my colleagues, too could see the transcripts for those WhatsApp chats. Oh my gosh. I'll send them. <laughs> I'll send them. <laughs> Give me, <laughs> let me do it. I'll send an email. They're so sad. I, I think people need to know. I mean, my experience <laughs> is that students are severely stressed right now. And a lot of it is, is just information yeah. overload. You know, all their classes are on different platforms. They have different logins for everything. They're having a really hard time keeping track. And, you know, they're also living through a pandemic. Yeah. That's, a, yeah. that's another thing. I feel like some, most of my professors that I've had are very human, very understanding people. Like Dr. Vina, always human, always. I've never in my life caught her in a moment where she wasn't understanding of like people's situations and like what's going on. It's like, if she sees you trying, she's always going to extend the hand to help you if you need it. That's in my mind, what a professor is supposed to do. Some, they don't do that. Some of them, they take a stressful situation and they make it even more stressful. I hate to like harp on to the natural sciences department, but they're one of them. They don't make this easier for us. And I understand it's hard for everyone, even them, but we're, we're literally drowning. You're throwing a whole bunch of stuff at us and this stuff is hard. <laughs> like none of us are, are that kid from smart guy. You guys remember that show from the 90s smart guy? I used to love it. But <laughs> it's just like, we're not, we're not TJ. We're not, not all of us are geniuses. Like some of us really have to work hard and need that extra understanding in order to get it. And we're just not getting that right now. So. Right. And it seems like I'm sure part of it is that, as you point out, they're overwhelmed and there aren't enough of us. I, I hope I've been understanding this semester I really hope I have, and I think I have, but at the same time, I know that I haven't been able to, I just, again, have not been able to give as much as I have wanted to because of these circumstances. And you know, I teach at CUNY because I want to work with students like my mom. I want to work with students like Tiara. Like, that's why I'm here, man. And it's been really hard to do that to the level that I want to because I don't have the resources. We don't have the resources. We don't have the resources in terms of time. We, we don't have the resources in terms of reasonable class sizes. We don't have the resources in terms of, you know, faculty support systems. And, you know, so many, my department laid off so many adjuncts. All of our class sizes are huge. So, and I feel terribly for the adjuncts who are laid off. That's awful. You know, losing your livelihood, losing your, your health insurance. Um, and we're, we're struggling without them. The PSC CUNY, our union, which you mentioned earlier, and an organization called CUNY Rising Alliance, which is largely student-led, I believe, are proposing a new deal for CUNY, which... Uh, hopefully will become legislation that would return CUNY to free tuition. It would add yeah. 5,000 faculty lines and, and there are a bunch of other items there. And I think this is, from my perspective, the kind of revolution we need because currently our budgets are directly tied to student tuition and it turns students into consumers and they feel that, that they're here because uh, the institution needs their money to run, whether they're paying it directly or it comes from financial aid. It's anybody's guess how much traction it will or won't get. 
But I would love to hear from the two of you what you would put on your wish list for CUNY if it could be revolutionized the way that we hope it can. I've got a list. Excellent. I want to hear the list. <laughs> yes, Tiara, I want to hear the list too, because I think sometimes <laughs> I'm so focused on deficit and not desire. Like mm -hmm. I've been like trained not to have like strong desires <laughs> um, in this context. So yeah, Tiara, why don't you start and I can I mean, brainstorm. As a student currently, mm -hmm. I would love mm. to have more access to tutors um, like per mm. this semester, especially there are barely any STEM tutors available, even online, nothing. Um, I would love also for, I don't know, I think possibly like, mm -hmm a little more leeway when it comes to um, homework programs that we have to purchase and like textbooks, especially for natural sciences, because they're expensive. Like some of them are like $140 for a homework, like for a, a homework program just for the semester. Like it, that's a little outrageous, just saying. Um, <laughs> there's also no way to get around that. So a little help there would be nice. Um, if we could also have, I would say, more um, more opportunities in like research in all in all departments, honestly. Like, if you wanted to be a psychologist, if you wanted to be um, someone who also teaches and professes in urban studies or English, like. We should have more like hands-on like internships available so people can actually get a real-time feel on campus because the reality is a lot of people don't have time off campus like the average college student some a lot of people have to work full-time and they have kids and they have lives so it's like where is where does that leave time to really like intern mm -hmm. and no so that would be cool um i know i have a list those were only three. So, <laughs> but I got more somewhere in here. Yeah. I mean, this, your list is amazing and it's all about intellectual development, um, which is what a college should be about. So um, I am, I'm basically with the CUNY New Deal in that I think more tenure track faculty is so critical. So, you know, they're saying 5,000. Um, and I, I guess I trust their number. I mean, in my own department, I think we would ideally, well, I should not say a number because then I'll probably say a number that's too low and my chair will be like, what? <laughs> Don't do that. I won't commit to a number, but we need more full-time faculty members in my department, um, which is urban studies. So that we can offer class sizes, or we can offer class sizes of, you know, a reasonable number, and we can also diversify our course offerings. Um, but I do love, you know, this idea of having just more funding available for internships um, and for research experiences, for instance, with faculty. Um, you know, I would totally work with undergraduates, um, and I have worked with undergraduates who have funding um, on research, but the funding is unsteady. Um, I am, I've gotten involved with pre-law advising at QC, and one of the things I've been interested in getting funding for um, the prep class to take the LSAT, which is the standardized test required for law school admission. And you know, these are things that are important for people moving forward. Um, and I guess I just, you know, ideally I want to create a place that gives people options, right? So that they're able to connect with their desires. And so, you know, that they're able to realize their, you know, professional goals and intellectual goals. I mean, so... 
that's, I mean, ideally, I don't want a new swimming pool. I don't want, you know, new tennis courts. I don't need, you know, like fancy landscaping. That's not to me what a university is, although, you know, at a lot of other schools that, you know, is what it is. But that's, for me, not what CUNY is about. Um, We already have a beautiful campus. I would say on the other side of that, I would put on my list uh, decent ventilation in classrooms, classrooms that are not run down, classrooms that fit the number of people who need to be in them. I mean, just showing basic respect to our students. The th- one thing that drives me crazy is how doors to classrooms all over campus are kept oh, open geez. by garbage cans. It's just so disrespectful, right? It's just not right. It's You're not going to see that at NYU. No, that's true. That's true. Um, but also, oh, also classrooms that are not 100 degrees or freezing. Yeah, the HVAC situation, I don't understand. I will say that, mm-hmm. you know, there there's weird humidity stuff going on in my departmental offices. So there are like tiles that are like ceiling tiles that are peeling and then the carpet's like bubbling up and I don't know what's like underneath any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And Powder Maker, mm-hmm. it's weird because Powder Maker is a relatively new building. So I don't, I don't get it. I would say like, it's kind of like a blanket statement, what I'm about to say, but I just wish CUNY would get the same kind of love that SUNY gets. I'm going to say it. SUNY gets preferential treatment, especially with the funding. That's why a lot of their facilities and their labs are so updated and all of their classrooms are so updated. Like I've seen, they look, they look so new and like, It's just a lot of the problems that we have in not all, but most of our CUNY like institutions, they don't have those issues at majority, at the majority of SUNY schools. And that's just a fact. So I feel that's just another jab at like lower income black and brown people once again, because you know that 70% of CUNY students are black and brown other, whereas in SUNY, it's it's literally flipped. That ratio is literally flipped. So I don't know. I feel like I, I kind of side eye that also. And then I look at Cuomo and I'm just like, hmm, are you giving that same kind of energy to SUNY schools? Or is this really just directed at CUNY? Like, how exactly is this working? I wish I could just like talk to him. I really hope that conversation happens. And that brings me to my next question, which is if you could say anything to CUNY leaders, uh, upper level administrators, what would you want to say? What would you like them to do? What What would you like to see from them? Basically, we are, we're an institution that is doing critical work in the city, the state and the nation. And our students deserve an excellent education. And right now your funding policies are completely thwarting that mission and it's unacceptable. So I want to see them up in arms. I understand that they, that they themselves do not draft the state budget. I completely understand that, but I want to see them furious. Personally, I would like to see Basically, also what Dr. Vina just said, I would love to see them up in arms. You should be out here fighting the hardest because at the end of the day, like I understand that your pockets may be nicely lined with your salary and, you know, the things that you were able to accomplish when you went to CUNY, like not our new QC president, but, you know, like um, the CUNY chancellor. He, Felix Mathos, I'm assuming, I believe, um, you know, he went to CUNY, I believe. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure. He didn't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, like, just, like, make a stance, make noise, because if anybody's voice is going to be heard, it's going to be theirs. Like, especially, like, on a state level, on that government level. So it's just like, yeah, we they hear the students. There's so many of us, right? But at the end of the day, like, we're just kids, quote unquote, to a lot of, like, government officials and things of that nature. It's been like that since forever. Even when like flower power and stuff was happening in the 60s, like all oh, these kids, like they just, you know, the Vietnam, like it's, it's, they don't take us seriously. So we need somebody who's esteemed. We need our professors, our adjunct professors. We need our leaders literally to go out there like blazing. Stop taking, stop taking from us. Like you can't, we can't afford to have anything else taken from us. We can't. We can't. It's absolutely true. And it, it comes back to the understaffing issue. We've, we don't have enough people working at CUNY colleges and we've got way too much bureaucracy. I see students frustrated all the time with the institution. And like Natalie said, you know, a lot of this, comes uh, from the state government. I mean, you could go further to the federal government and the fact that education isn't prioritized enough. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people working at Queens College are simply doing their best with a bad situation, but it has an effect on students. And I'm just curious to hear from you, Tiara, about your experience of getting the kinds of help and support you need at CUNY. Do you find that you can get it easily? Um, within CUNY, it, it's had its moments. <laughs> it's had its moments, especially when it comes to like financial aid or when it comes to inquiring about registrar or something. And there's always like this back and forth, like, oh, you have to email her. You email her. Oh, no, you have to go back to him. And I'm just like, listen, I need to know what's going on with my FAFSA. Somebody help me. But that's, that's a good point that you brought up about UCLA. Like, I, I'm not a student of University of Michigan. My partner is because he's going, he's currently in his 2L year at UMich for law. So he's in that program now. And just me going back and visiting him like last year, U Michigan is just such a nicely oiled, smooth machine, academically speaking. It's just the facilities are so beautiful, up to date. Um, you know, all the students seem pretty happy. There's a building to go to for an issue. It's just, there's just never any issues, especially when I speak to students who, who go there. And I'm just like, this is a state school. So what's going on with CUNY? Like, why can't we follow that same type of lead? I don't understand it. I don't either. When I, when I, was first out of graduate school I had a postdoc for four years at Princeton and I just was astounded to see how much support those students get every need they could ever have has been anticipated by somebody and I wish that for all of CUNY students yeah I mean I can speak to that I went to a small liberal arts college called Williams College for undergrad um, it, it is like, it's definitely the opposite of CUNY in terms of student demographics. And, um, it was a difficult experience in a lot of ways, but 
you know, that those were, you know, it was difficult socially, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but wow, I think that's one of the reasons why I am really motivated as a professor, because I have seen over the course of my life, the profound disparities in higher education, and it makes no sense. Like I know what the kids at, for instance, Williams College get compared to what the kids at Queens College get. And it's infuriating. And, you know, it's when we're talking about like racial, you know, like the racial composition of the two campuses, um, when we're talking about the class composition, those are inextricable from the quality of education that folks are getting. And it's not just the quality of education, it's also all of the opportunities, the paid internships, um, for instance, the access to tutors, like Tiara was talking about, you know, just basically what Jason said, like every need is anticipated. Um, So I, yeah, it really, the disparity in those experiences just really motivates me. Also, just to like throw this little tidbit in, I need them them as in the government, our state government to really understand that CUNY has produced so many amazing people, so many amazing contributors to science, to literature, to civil rights, like people that have won Nobel Peace Prizes and like CUNY students are awesome. We're amazing. Like we literally find the diamonds in the rough and you'd be shocked at how many diamonds there are. But if you keep taking away our funding, if like, I'm not, it's like, it's not shocking, but it's just like, you keep pulling away this funding and then you complain about the people who are on public assistance. You complain about these people that are in need, but then you're taking away their resource to no longer be in that position. And for all you know, that kid that you're raising the tuition on, so now they can't afford it, they could be the next like manufacturer of a vaccine to prevent cancer. You just, you don't know. And it baffles me that they don't think this far ahead just because of their own thoughts, like their own like biases, like in their own mind. Like, think bigger. You're a politician. I know you guys like lie a lot and stuff, but you have to still be human somewhere in there. Come on. (laughs) This has been fantastic. And I feel like this conversation could go on all night. But as we near to a close, I'm wondering if there's anything either of you is just really dying to say or you want people to know or anything you'd like to say to each other. Um, One thing that I was sort of that I did sort of want to ask TR about, and I don't know where exactly this is going, but um, I had originally drafted this op-ed to be about women of color at CUNY specifically, because I mean, something amazing, like 46% of CUNY undergraduates are women of color. 46% of CUNY undergraduates are women of color. I, so many of my students, I kind of want to say most of my personal students are women of color. Um, And that might be a coincidence because, you know, of the topics I teach or because of my own profile as a woman of color. I don't know. But that, there's something so amazing and powerful about that number for me. Again, I think because I'm a woman of color, it's just such a privilege to be able to teach other women of color and to be in a community of learners with other women of color. Um, So one of the things I guess I wanted to ask Tiara about is, you know, what has it been like to be a black woman at Queens College specifically? Because I think that's part of what Queens College is reckoning with right now. Our particular campus does not have a large black student body. Um, And I think we, the percentage of black students on our campus is lower than the percentage of black folks in Queens, for instance. Um, And then, you know, when you go to Brooklyn, Medgar Evers, you know, other four-year colleges and then two-year colleges, we just have way fewer black students. 
I know a lot of faculty are concerned about this. I'm very concerned about this, but I know a ton of faculty are concerned about this. And I'm just wondering what your experiences have been like as, um, yeah, as a Black woman on campus. It's definitely noticed everything that you just said. It's noticed. I look around when when we were on campus and I've noticed that there's not many of people like myself. Um, people of color, yes, absolutely. Just not Black um, people of color. But um, all in all, I'm an optimist by nature for the most part. So I just, I go with the flow. I personally haven't had any type of like racist run-ins or anything of that or, you know, um, anything of that nature. I haven't had any troubling situations like that, but I have noticed it, but it kind of also empowers me a little more, not going to lie, because of the fact that I see that there's not many of me. It makes me want to go harder. It makes me want to be more it makes me, it kind of even makes me think about po the possibility of even professing myself and teaching myself later on after, you know, I practice for a few years because um, I just really, really think that Black women, we have so much passion and we have so much fight inside of us. And, you know, we're starting to discover that now, especially in this time this social climate, we're starting to realize how actually brilliant and amazing so many of us actually are. So I think it's coming. Like, I think that storm of like, especially Black women are just coming, like even the QC, like it's within the next five years, I feel like we're going to see a lot of us on these campuses a lot more. And um, just being great and doing the best that I possibly can while I'm in these classes taking the information as much as I can from these classes and applying it to everything I do moving forward. Um, I think that's literally how that's going to even fix that problem long term, like little by little, but we will get there. So I'm excited about it, honestly. You've been listening to QC Pod, the podcast about all things Queens College. We're on Twitter at QC Pod and on the web at queenspodcastlab.org/slash QC Pod. Our theme music is Lake Monsters by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. I'm Jason Tuga. Thanks for listening. <laughs>